Uh, so I'm sure many of the candidates will stick around after if you want to see them and have a question specifically. So. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Most of these are so far pretty much the same subject. We're going to start at this end, I think, with Claudia and go down um, for responses to this. And uh, so um, it's fracking. Can New York's economy thrive without moving forward with fracking for methane gas? And we'll start with Claudia first. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting that uh, my opponent, don't disagree with them, brought up the energy costs. And uh, as a small business owner, we have the luxury of having a, our plant located on a municipal power source. So if it weren't for that, we probably wouldn't even be able to survive in New York State because we obviously run a competitive business and we have no, virtually no New York customers or competitors, or New York competitors. So uh, on the issue of fracking, this is a complicated one. I think we need to explore all energy resources that we can. My biggest concern with the fracking right now is the ability of DEC to monitor this uh, activity, especially with the uh, what we call uh, the, the horizontal deep well fracking. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize, I, I came to the assembly, I wasn't an expert on fracking, I'm still not, but we've had a lot, quite a bit of education on it. Uh, one thing I didn't realize uh, when I started in uh, two years ago is that we have 14,000 active vertical wells in the state of New York right now, which actually are very, our Western New York uh, colleagues are very dependent on, they're always voting in favor of, uh, of all the, the fracking. And I always wondered why, but I didn't realize that we had 14,000 active wells. So my greatest concern with this is, is once we get above the, above the ground, we have fracking fluid, which I think needs to be monitored by DEC as a hazardous waste. And what ends up happening is I, my experiences with DEC as a staff person and now as an assembly member, and uh, not that they're, they're great divisions of DEC, of course, but I think we don't have the resources to right now to monitor the activity of the fracking fluid. And uh, it was interesting that this year's budget, the, the, the governor put no money aside to give DEC the resources to do that. So until such time as I think DEC is equipped to handle, uh, what, handle this type of activity, I, I will not support it. And uh, though I think it's something that we should look to in the future, I think we need to explore it more carefully. And I'm talking about the, the, uh, the horizontal high volume fracking, not the vertical fracking that's currently going on in Western New York. Thanks. Well, the original <laughs> red flag for me of what fracking was, it was initially, it still is, banned from the New York City watershed. Now, what does that tell you? And on my handout, it says, one, it's safe enough for the New York City watershed, then it'll be safe enough for the rest of us. Now, that's pretty clear and concise, I think. And um, the fluid, I don't know, I'm just against it at current form. I understand now that there is a technology up in Canada where they go gas fracking. If you can do this without water or out these uh, hidden chemicals, and plus the fact that the Congress, I understand Mr. Cheney, excluded them from the Clean Water Act of 2004. When all that changes, that's when I'll start maybe supporting hydro fracking. Thank you. I'm going to go back to uh, Ward's original question is, can the state of New York uh, maintain its economy without fracking? And my simple answer, my belief, is yes. And as I look at my district, much of it is rural, I've been working with the Department of Economic Development to focus on such things as value-added manufacturing, uh, food and fiber production locally. Uh, just for example, in the southeastern corner, southwestern corner of my district is Chobani. You saw Chobani all over the, uh, the Olympics. Started with seven employees, went to over 200, is now doubled again in size in the, uh, in the region, is buying every ounce of, of uh, class two fluid milk, and is creating economic opportunity. In this part of the, of the region, I helped recruit a, a goat cheese manufacturer from France, and we took an, an idle entomans plant in Columbia County and have created new jobs. So the issue of economic development has to be beyond casinos, it's got to be beyond uh, retail sales, it's got to be back to the issue of value-added manufacturing, use of local food and fiber, producing locally because we are importing products uh, from, from around the world. So can we survive without fracking? We can. Uh, can we be more creative in state government with how we promote business and economic development? We absolutely can. Ladies and gentlemen, I just
join my colleagues in saying, don't frack with New York. I think we can do, yeah, well, uh, the reason why I said that is because, you know, two major things. First of all, I was born on an island where there were no trees, very little water, and, you know, when I, when I came to this country and I, for the first time I saw the Hudson Valley and I saw the Hudson River, rather, I mean, I thought I'd discover the promised land and I couldn't wait to write my father and say, I found the promised land, you know, the trees and, and the water and so on. And so, yes, can he generate jobs? Of course. Uh, the question is, uh, at what cost? Um, what, what good is a job if I cannot quench my thirst with a clean glass of water? And those elements that created us, I mean, water and air and soil and so on, they're all in danger. So for that reason, I think we have to find a better way rather than continue to depend on finite resources that are continuing to destroy our environment. Thank you. Fracking has a lot of positives to it. It's, uh, we pump lots of money into our economy and create lots of jobs. But it has to be achieved through a balance, and it is, has to, we have to be certain that our environment is protected. And hope if we could ever achieve that and do it safely, it would do wonders for New York. But I don't think it's quite the time right now. Thanks. Um, so our next question has to do with the tax cap, which was passed, and our, our um, chamber member is asking our panel today to discuss the 2% tax cap as it specifically uh, pertains to the uh, mandate relief, which was not apparently part of that legislation. So we'll go in reverse order and start with Christine. So if you would just give us your position on mandate relief um, at the state level, Christine. We clearly need mandate relief at the state level. And, um, the problem is that you have the state making all these mandates, and here you have households um, working within a budget, and you have local municipalities that are um, coming up with creative ways to save money, and then along comes the state with these mandates that we just can't afford. And the sad part is the 2% tax cap, I thought was just the most wonderful thing going. But the city I live in hasn't lived by it, you know, for the last two years. And it's very unfair. So I wish that we could get rid of some of the unfunded mandates so that we could live within our means and enjoy a 2% tax cap. Thank you. Well, first of all, unfunded mandates. I. There are many things that we want to see. I don't think there's a single mandate that we don't want to see or uh, implement it. I mean, whether it is, you know, uh, handicap accessible uh, classrooms or, or doors that are easily open in case of an emergency and so on and so forth. I'm just trying to say that these mandates are things we want. My problem is, is that if we are going to ask the local schools, the local communities, municipalities uh, to do something from the state or the federal government, then we ought to have the goal to fund those mandates that we actually ask people to, to implement. That's my problem. So there should not be any unfunded mandates. Uh, with respect to the 2% cap, yes, many people thought this would be a panacea to many of our problems, but obviously the 2% cap is an arbitrary number which has affected our school districts uh, to do the job. So I know that Kevin and I uh, have a few bills that are based on a broad statewide kind of approach where everyone contributes uh, to the importance of educating our children. And so we have got to better find a better way to um, fund our schools uh, rather than having a 2% cap, which is really, again, arbitrary. Thank you. To the issue of mandates. So we have mandates that are unfunded, 
We also have mandates that are underfunded. And the mandates come from the federal government, the mandates come from the state government, the mandates come from the legislature, the mandates come from state agencies. And so part of the challenge is when the cap issue was brought up, and I remember having breakfast, we were having uh, small sessions uh, with the governor, uh, Governor Cuomo. And he was, he was uh, addressed on the issue of the cap versus mandate relief. And his simple, his simple answer to the question of why not do the mandate relief first was that no one would come to the table. And he was right, because if people don't feel the pressure, if governments, if schools don't feel the pressure of limited resources, which we're all dealing with with recession, then no one will address uh, or feel compelled to address how we rein in government spending and how we put in priority effective use of, of our limited dollars. The challenge is that the mandate relief was to accompany the cap. That has not happened. And despite the best uh, uh, intent of the governor and the legislature, mandate relief has been uh, a disappointment. The lieutenant governor has uh, instituted the mandate relief task force. I've been in a number of hearings, including ones recently in New Paltz. In that period, in a short period, state education issued eight new mandates. Right, including body mass index, you name it. So the challenge is, with mandates, are we intelligent enough to, to understand that someone's mandate is someone else's protection or privilege? And to get into that intelligence and, and try to, to work our way out of it. Not thrash around like a swimmer in the weeds, but slowly disentangle and, and make better use of our limited dollars. So the mandate relief is critical, but it's going to require a thoughtful dialogue across the community. Thank you. sort of stay away from mandate relief because I think there are always good intentions to follow the mandate relief. But regarding the tax cap, I'm a good blue collar guy who's 60 years old who still works every day and I'm damn lucky I still do. Most of us are now at the point of retirement and our incomes are going to go down and yet cost of government keeps going up. Uh, consolidation of government service I think is the ultimate answer, especially in uh, smaller towns in the valley where I live and I would assume down here in the Hudson Valley is the same thing. There's been no impetus to consolidate government services in Herkimer County. We have five village police departments and a sheriff's department that does not do road patrols. So we have a sheriff's department that watches our old jail. The big thing is to build a new jail for $40 million and close down our elder, elderly home to pay for the new jail. And in the name of efficiency, we need this new jail so the jailers won't have to go up and down stairs. <laughs> Most of the jailers that I know could use a few walks up and down the stairs. <laughs> um, plus, in the Mohawk Valley, we have a bunch of old factory buildings that are just sitting there with lots of stairs on them. And they would make great jails for people who need to be in jail. But do we do anything like that? No. So you wonder why the 2% tax, the tax cap doesn't work? Well, there's one example. Thank you. <laughs> reluctantly because I sat at the same breakfast that Pete Lopez sat at where we were promised mandate relief. And uh, of course, I had to re happily report back to the school district, which is where my current uh, district office is, and said, yes, we just gave you $170 million statewide in mandate relief for the tax cap, for which was about $500 in savings to our school district. And as Pete mentioned, you know, we ended up imposing at least eight new mandates on our school districts. And uh, we never really got to the real heart of the issue, uh, the greatest single mandate that faces New York State, and that's Medicaid. And uh, there was a great bill that came through from Amy Holland, a Democrat, uh, to eventually take Medicaid, the, medi the, the local share, which is 25%, and give that back to the state, along with reform of Medicaid, and which is essential and will be insolvent if we don't reform it. Uh, I, I, I was hoping that bill would come through and that the governor and the uh, leaders would help us negotiate that and get that done. I think that there's still hope we could do it now. I would support that uh, 100% because it's about a billion dollars a week for Medicaid. And we know the fraud and waste is enormous in Medicaid. And if we just went in line with federal standards with our Medicaid benefits, we would probably see actually millions and millions in savings. So that would be a reduction you know, to our, our mandates that we impose on our local governments in the one instance. 
Again, I, I didn't really, I reluctantly voted for the tax cap. It sounds great. It's a temporary fix. Uh, taxpayers love it. I'm a taxpayer. I pay property taxes in uh, three or four different locations in my area. And I know I love having, the, having it in place. But uh, it is really like putting a Band-Aid on a tumor until you resolve the underlying problem. And that's what we're seeking to do, hopefully, in another term. Thank you. So uh, before I uh, neglect to mention, part of what uh, our effort is to in, in just kind of educate and inform folks not only about the candidates but the issues today, uh, our Senate candidates will be here in October doing the same thing, October the 23rd. But Vic Work and Tom Turco are here today from the Board of Elections. Are you guys as well still here? Where is Tom? Where is Victor? So is today National Registration Day or is tomorrow or? Every day at our office. All right then. So I hope everyone is registered to vote here. If you're not, can you still register? October 12th is the last day. That's the drop-dead day. All right, and the League of Women Voters. Year, but this year only, we'll offer a special to everyone in Ulster County. If you forget on October 12th, and you don't stop by or mail us a registration postmark on the 12th, <laughs> we will be open for you this year only from 2 to 9 on October 13th. Stop by our office. Don't forget. Oh, nice. <laughs> and the League, do you have registration forms? Cindy Bell has them here. Didn't, or if you know somebody who needs one, can you take it back to the office with you? That would save us the time. And sure. Wonderful. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, so a question or two more. Uh, in Ulster County, there are a number of projects. Folks know, I think, already that have been on the, uh, in, in the approval process for years, uh, uh, at least one of them for, for 14 years. Can anything uh, be done to improve the approval process for economic development in New York State? And we'll start here with Claudia. Yeah, I assume you're meeting the seeker process, yes. among other things. I, we hope so. Uh, as a person who I, I've waited for months and months and months to get approvals from New York State for our business, and of course, eventually the, the opportunity passes. And that's something that we have to recognize in New York. Uh, and as a business person coming into the, the assembly, you know, obviously government doesn't work like business, and uh, it's very frustrating at times. But I think that we have to start recognizing uh, in, in government and start impressing upon those, those in leadership that we cannot wait any longer for businesses to leave New York. And uh, we've lost, in, our, in my own company, we've lost uh, numerous opportunities uh, because of the seeker process in trying to get uh, built our uh, you know, land approved, uh, that we could have, uh, you know, just, uh, have just a simple in increase in our manufacturing facility uh, just, it's just, you know, regulations from across the board in New York State are very onerous. And uh, we, I, as a member, I'm actually the ranker on the Small Business Committee, and we've been going throughout the state trying to find uh, all the different types of uh, regulations from Department of Labor to DEC to where, whatever administrative agency you're dealing with, and how to correct those, those top ten items and how we can eliminate them and, and smooth out the process so we can advance and grow our businesses locally. Uh, and so, you know, I encourage your, anyone that has any input on that, I greatly appreciate it. I know I've received a lot uh, from my current district and I would greatly like to know what's going on in Ulster County and what, what problems you face. Uh, and I just want to give you a quick thing, excuse me, 30 seconds. I had a hardware store uh, owner come in to visit me this year and one of his biggest problems was he, the, uh, they came in and said, you know, your exit light is not illuminated. That'll be a $2,500 fine. Now this man could just go to the shelf, pick up a battery and put it in. And that's the kind of stuff that we're doing to our own businesses that are here, who love New York, who want to stay here, who are providing jobs, who are giving to the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts and all our local businesses. So uh, I, just, I just think we need to really stop and think, of what are we doing with some of these regulations and hurting our own families, because those are mouths being fed as well. Thank you. Water and power. These are the things I think the government needs to be involved in. The Mohawk River has been polluted now forever. Um, Oneida County's been under the gun for, since Elliot Spitzer was there, spent $180 million to improve their sewer plant, and that has dragged on. And I understand uh, Mr. Pacenti there, doesn't have the money. Well, this affects the entire state, including the Hudson River, because hello, that's where the Mohawk River goes. I believe the state should get involved and clean up the Mohawk River. That said, energy. 
I'd like to see our energy costs get down at least to the national average. And I have a mentor in this business I, what I ran into back when I campaigned against Mr. Butler, Mr. Leon Kalmus from Oneon in New York, who had taken on this issue forever and ever. And he said, don't, don't talk until you come and see me. He opened up his file. He gave me a letter that he sent to Mr. Pataki back in, uh, when Mr. Pataki was there. And basically he said that every time economic development was discussed, cheap power was offered. That was the thing that got uh, the economy moving. And his solution to this was have the New York State Power Authority start buying the stock, the national grid, and New York State Electric and Gas, and slowly take them over so we have a power system that is one, uh, like a single payer health insurance thing, where they provide the power from start to finish. And I dis disagree with Mr. Tonko, who was at a meeting that was last night, who set this up where National Grid has a monopoly on distribution, and all the bills in the Mohawk Valley now are distribution is three quarters time what the power generation is. And you wonder why people go in other states. Thank you. So back to the question, how do we improve and speed up business opportunity? Part of it really goes back to Governor Cuomo's statement about New York being open for business. And the issue is, we can't just put a, a tile or hang a sign on our door and say we're open as a state. Part of the challenge is, what is the culture and what is the underlying philosophy of those who are part of the approval process? So whether it's uh, state liquor authority or local zoning, is there a, an underlying premise that supports and advances the creation and support of family farms and our businesses. So whether, uh, I'll give you a couple quick examples. Um, my region was devastated by the floods, uh, much of my district, Ulster, Delaware, Greens, where my parents were homeless, my sister homeless. Um, we are struggling as a region to rebuild. In a simple conversation with DEC, Region 4, we spoke about a home heating oil business that was trying to get back on its feet, create three new businesses that were all part of it, a little garage, uh, gas station. And in that discussion, there was a groundwater contamination issue that they had to resolve. The agency had a choice. They could either crush the business or work proactively to help them recover and be part of building the economy. With our collective work and with the right uh, philosophical thrust from the department, they chose to help rebuild the business. And so as we look at everyday business in New York State, do we have agencies, do we have local officials, do we have others who are saying, yes, we want to protect water. Yes, we want to provide for public safety. But in the same breath, we want our businesses to grow and flourish. So that cuts across the board. And really, it's a philosophical shift. And that's where we need to be. Support our, our primary uh, functions, support our, our social goals, but realize that businesses fund our schools, fund our roads and bridges, create opportunity for our children, and make that a philosophy and an everyday part of our doing business in New York. Thank you. I don't think there's anything more important than economic growth and job creation. Obviously, if we are to solve our problems, this is the only way to do it. And we know that small businesses in particular are the backbone of our economy. Everybody says that, but I'm not sure how many people have actually been in business. I can assure you I've been in business since the age of 22, and I've been hiring people since then. And, uh, you know, what do business want? They want less regulation, less obstacles, one-stop shopping where I can go and get my permits, get things moving. And, of course, less taxation. Um, you know, if you want to see the progress in your communities, the, the best way to find out is to go to your local building and planning and zoning and see how many permits are issued. That's how you determine whether or not you're moving forward. So less regulations make things easier. And I can assure you, I've taken out a lot of building permits. And I came to a point where I said, you know, no longer would I deal, for example, with the city of Poughkeepsie, where a building and a zoning and a planning department is one in which they throw the book at you rather than say, let's sit down and see how we can make things happen. How are we going to help you to create jobs and create revenues for our local economy and our state? I understand small businesses, and I will do everything in my power to help them. Thank you. The regulations and the high taxes in New York State are killing businesses. We have um, so many businesses that have so many regulations and 
the taxes, it's very difficult to survive. And if you, as a result of that, you have less job creation. And I support uh, job training and connecting with um, the, pe the businesses, with the, um, the people with the local institutions, the educate to retrain workers so that they're ready for this 21st century. But if you don't, if there's too much government in our lives, we just can't survive. And we need the jobs, certainly, and the businesses in New York. So we'll let, we'll conclude. Give the uh, each candidate the opportunity to give some closing remarks. Uh, may well have something they'd like to say that was not asked in a question, and we'll do it in the reverse order um, and start down here, if we could, with uh, Christine, if you would. I'm really happy to be running for the 101st, 104th Assembly District. We, um, you know, you can't just sit back and complain. Sometimes you have to get off the sidelines and throw your hat in the ring and try and make a difference. I'm hoping to make a difference. Uh, sh you know, should I be fortunate enough to be elected, I would work for a smaller government and more freedom. Thank you. Five years ago, I was recruited to run for office. I said, no, 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 and for three months they kept on saying yes, yes, yes. I finally gave in, and here we are. But, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a businessman. I went to Albany with that mentality. How do I help people, small people, small businesses, taxes, and so on? These are the things that I understand. And I can assure you, uh, during the time that I've been in Albany, I've been an independent voice, doing what is best for my community and the constituents. And I think I have proven to be a public servant who cares about the life and livelihood of his community. I've been effective in passing legislation as well as bringing needed resources to our community. Uh, there are many things that we were able to do and I hope that I will continue to do so in the future. Thank you. First, I'd just like to thank the community for the privilege of having been able to serve for the last five years. I'm passionate about our community. I'm passionate about people. I'm passionate about service. I'm also someone who doesn't believe in just being a reactionary. As a society, we need to move forward. We can't just be out there with our catcher's mitt out. And lately, uh, I can tell you, my region, that, that's been, everything's been incoming. But for us to move forward, we need to be out thinking out of the box. We need to be proactive. And that's my belief, that's my promise, and that's what I bring to the to this community. And I uh, hope I'll be able to, to uh, serve you again in the next two years. Thanks again. I have served as a city alderman for four years and as a county legislator for two. And I understand every time when you get into a quagmire with legislation, the county attorney would always say, give me nine votes, get 17 members and you can pretty much do what you want. Obviously, you have to work with all the members of the assembly in order to get anything done. And if elected, I had a lot of practice in doing that. I'm pretty good at the referee as a county uh, chairman for the Democratic Committee this year. And uh, I understand that is what the job really entails. So if elected, I will work with my fellow uh, assembly people to get things that like we mentioned here today out that are strong and near and dear to me, cheaper energy, clean water, and moving New York State forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. I love getting the last word. Uh, just wanted to say thank you for all of you to, for coming out so early this morning. Uh, this has been a great opportunity for me to eventually get to know all of you, I hope. And uh, it's, uh, it's been uh, a challenge in the Assembly for the first two years. Uh, I'll, you know, working with Kevin has always been such a pleasure, though. And uh, of course, working with my colleagues as well here. But uh, I really came to this job looking as, uh, as a business person primarily and to try to help our region. Uh, my family's from New York and we hope to be here uh, forever. And uh, just hope to make New York a better place to live. We have everything it, we need and everything it takes to get, as Pete says, to move forward. 
And, and I hope to, I hope that we, we will succeed and continue to grow and become the Empire State again, because that's really where our roots are and where our future is. And uh, you know, as a small business owner, I'd like to actually double our business if, if we can. And, and Chobani, by the way, is a customer of ours, so happy to, to have them grow and, uh, and help our dairy farmers as well. And I uh, just would uh, look forward to uh, talking to any of you or uh, if you have any comments, suggestions, or anything, and, and help me learn a little bit more about Ulster County, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Great, so thanks to, uh, to all of our candidates. And again, a reminder, please, October 23rd, meet your New York State Senate candidates. Uh, same place, same time, right here at the Holiday Inn. We're doing a procurement workshop at 945, how to do business with county government right here. You can stay if you'd like for that. We'd love to have you. October the 10th, 7 p.m., Miller School, the Congress.